Hi, I'm Bart Massey. Welcome to Computer Sound and Music. Hope everyone's doing well out there. Today I want to talk to you very briefly about delay effects, which is sort of its own topic. And really, in a few words, we can say a lot, I think, about how they work and what they are and what they do. So let's just go ahead and jump in and get started. So we haven't talked much so far about the ability to store a signal and give back a delayed copy of it. That's a thing that was sort of a holy grail in the analog days. The You could record a signal just fine, but to real-time supply a delayed copy of a signal was incredibly tricky and was a challenge. So it's great that now we're in a situation where we can actually do that perfectly and with zero delay and at very, very low cost. And so given how cheap and good it is, we're going to be hearing a lot of that in everything we do. It's essentially become a go-to effect for modern sound processing. And the interesting thing about delay is that in the time domain, like we've talked about a little bit before, sort of different time scales do different things. If I have less than 10 milliseconds of delay, then the sound tends to cancel itself out, and those are the delays that are involved in localization of audio, trying to figure out where it's coming from, and so those are useful in their own right. And at medium delay, there's sort of an ensemble effect thing that happens that makes it sound like there's several copies of the song of the sound being played at the same time and that can be a really useful effect so yeah the this kind of ensemble effect can sound really amazing here's a commercial plug-in that does some ensemble delays to make it sound like multiple voices are singing a single voice can sing a simple song a song So that track was in three parts. There was first a single voice, and then there was that voice with an ensemble effect. So that's still a single voice, but it sounds like several people singing together. And then the last one was a four-part track with ensemble that sounded like a pretty good choir. So that's a nice range of effect as well. Finally, the longer delays, once you get over about 50 milliseconds up to a half second or longer, are used for reverb and echo effects, which are very common effects in the business. And obviously, you may not want just one delay. You might want to combine a bunch of delays to get an interesting effect. And it's quite common to take the delayed signal and chain it with other effects, maybe as a side chain, maybe as the regular chain. So for example, if you're trying to do a realistic echo, you probably want to do some low pass filtering to make it sound like it's coming from, or high pass, I forget which, to make it sound like it's coming from farther away. You may also want to do some noise in with the signal. And so you might have an effect side chain with delay filtering and noise to make an echoed sound mixed with the original dry signal and for an echo it is familiar that it can happen multiple times so it's very common this is one of the places where it's pretty common to have the delayed signal get fed back into the input to get reverb or echo effects and there's some interesting challenges there with respect to latencies and with respect to having the delay be what you want but it's usually pretty benign to feed a delayed signal back into the signal path and then you get reverberating effects. It's a big deal with these delay effects to mix the original signal with the delayed signal. Again, this is the echo thing. How much do you want the original to come through versus how much do you want the 
reverberated signal to come through. We usually call the process signal the wet signal and the original signal as it came in the dry signal. And most effects have a wet dry mix, but it's especially important for reverb effects. I find that surprisingly people aren't super familiar with the standard structure for a delay line, and so I thought it might be worth talking about some pseudocode. The, the typical structure here is what's called a ring buffer. I keep a head pointer and a tail pointer, and I, I insert samples into the head and extract them from the tail, and so it would be pretty typically looking like this. Mine is a little different implementation than a lot of people use. It's common to leave one extra cell in the buffer to distinguish between the empty and full cases, but I don't like that very much. I'd rather just have an empty flag. And so if the buffer is not full, then we can stick a sample into it, and we do that by just putting it at the tail pointer and then advancing the tail pointer by one, but wrapping around so that if we get to the end of the buffer, we go back to the beginning. That's why they call it a ring buffer is because it's notionally treated as a ring. And once we've inserted empty must be false, the dequeuing operation where we get a signal out of the ring buffer is the same thing, except now we extract from the head of the buffer so we, we, we cue on the tail, sorry, and extract from the head. And we use that same circular logic to bump the head pointer. And then we have to check whether we've taken the last sample, at which point we set the empty flag and return the signal. So that's how simple doing a digital delay is in software. It's absolutely a trivial operation, and that's why it's so often is because it's a great sound that you can get for very little thinking about it. One really common application of this kind of delayed signal is reverb and room effects type things. If you look at the acoustics of a room, like we talked about in the very first lecture, there's some long delays that happen, and then you bounce off something, a wall, the floor, the ceiling, some large object in the room. And that signal, of course, doesn't just bounce back to you, it bounces other places. And so you can get this complicated pattern of delays from the sound coming back, and your ear interprets that as a space. And in fact, there's some evidence that the ear does a pretty decent job of estimating the size and rough dimensions of the space from the reverberation that happens when a sound is launched in the space. There's a whole field of analysis where you apply an impulse in a space by doing something like a gunshot with a blank and then measure the echoes coming back and that can tell you a lot about the acoustics of the room. Uh, that's simulated all once you've got a model at a fairly basic level with a bunch of delay lines with different lengths or different taps in the same delay line or whatever. And again, like we were talking about with the echo effect, it's pretty typical to damp the thing when it reverberates and to filter it when it reverberates. And the easy way to do that is just the way we've been talking about, which is to use a delay line and stuff the output of the delay line back into the input to get reverberation. And like I say, that often is for room effects is sort of a multi-tap delay line. You're taking the signal with various different delays and stuffing it back into the input. But of course, that's not real physics. And if you really want to do it right, you model the air pressure in the room, essentially. You build a sound model that accounts for propagation in two-dimensional or even three-dimensional space, and you run that model forward, which is insanely computationally intensive, but can get 
amazing, amazing results when it's done properly. And this is the kind of thing that's at the heart of modern acoustics, the study of physical sound, which is its whole own discipline and absolutely has a fascinating research literature. So that's a few notes on delay effects. There's so much more to be said there, and we will say a little bit of it as we go forward, but I thought it was good to just have a quick chat about that before we go on to the much longer topic of frequency effects. Again, I hope everybody's doing well out there, and I will talk to you again soon.